Hey, all right. Well, if anybody else comes in, I'll let them in once, once we've given our introduction. Thank you so much for joining us uh, here today. Uh, my name is Megan Jacobs. I'm a professor here in the Honors College at UNM. And um, our Honors College Discovery Series highlights um, a range of scholars and their unique research and methodologies. Um, and I'm very happy to be co-hosting this event today with um, a student organization, um, Leaders for Environmental Action and Foresight, but most commonly known as UNM LEAF. Um, and today we'll be hearing from Vietza Sosi Pena from Tewa Women United and from Nancy Singham um, from the Land Witness Project. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the original peoples of the land in which the University of New Mexico sits. The Sandia Pueblo and the Navajo Nation have ties and stories on this land. We honor the land itself and acknowledge our committed relationship to indigenous people, and we gratefully recognize this history. I'm pleased to introduce Nancy Singham, who is a writer for the Land Witness Project, which is a collective um, that highlights stories of New Mexico's changing climate and its effects on our communities and ecosystems. The Land Witness Project aims to amplify the voices of people and communities on the front lines of climate change. Um, Singham is a Lobo, um, having earned her master's in um, early childhood education uh, from UNM. She worked as a public school uh, kindergarten teacher and then went on to study gardening and natural land restoration from the Morton Arboretum and the School of the Chicago Botanic Garden. Uh, for the past five years, she has served as a full-time volunteer on climate change issues in Albuquerque. Um, now I'm gonna turn it over to my co-host, um, to the UNM LEAF member, um, Sophia Jenkins Niato, who will introduce um, Pieta Sosi Pena um, from Tewa Women United. Thank you for being here today. Hi everyone, it's nice to be here. I'm from LEAF, I'm a student at UNM. Um, so I'm just gonna introduce Beata real quick and then you guys can take over. Um, so Beata is the Environmental Health and Justice Program Coordinator at Tewa Women United in Española, which is a multicultural and multiracial organization found in founded in 1989 yeah. and by Native and land-based women. Um, Beata is from Santa Clara Pueblo in El Rito, New Mexico. She's a mother, poet, advocate, and seed saver who is certified in indigenous sustainable design or permaculture. The realities of living next to a nuclear weapons complex have called her into environmental health and justice work with the nonprofit organization Tewa Women United for over a decade. As a part of her work, she currently manages the creation of the Española Healing Foods Oasis Demonstration Garden Project, and she works with them to unite um, to help young community members return to traditional farm techniques and grow indigenous foods. Um, so I guess, Nancy, you can go ahead and take over. All right. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, first, I'd just like to thank you and Amanda's program and Megan for bringing us to this discussion for the other uh, Facebook co-sponsors and also to recognize just very briefly the rest of the Land Witness uh, Project Collective who have built this project, uh, creator and founder Delise Delios, writer Steffi Weisberg, who's on this call right now, media lead Annie Hanna and our amazing videographer Christy Bodie. And also I'd just like to personally acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from histor historic uh, Tiwa land, which I tend to and honor as best as I know how. Um, since this forum is for honor students in order to <coughs> explain what the Land Witness Project is trying to do, I'm going to try to speed through a little bit of history, specifically looking at the question, what kind of problem is climate change? Uh, what we see in this history is an accumulation of answers, each one sort of adding on to the next in a layer cake kind of metaphor that I'm using here today. I hope right before dinner this isn't too off-putting, but here we go. Um, let's say that the first layer of this cake begins in 1988 when James Hansen and others testified about climate change for the first time before the U.S. Congress. In these hearings, climate change was expressed by climate scientists in scientific terms with graphs of carbon dioxide rise, charts of warming temperatures, analysis of ocean chemistry, ice melting, et cetera. So the first layer of this cake <coughs> is definitely climate change <coughs> as a scientific problem. And at the time, I actually think that many people hoped that that would that would be it. That would be the only description of the problem that would be needed. Scientists would explain what was happening scientifically and how bad the impacts would be. And everyone from school kids to policymakers would snap to it and get on with the solutions. 
But as we are keenly aware, that didn't happen. And while it certainly is a scientific problem, there is much more to this cake. So in the years after 1988, there arose a proposal to view climate change as an individual problem requiring a personal carbon footprint solution. I bet you've heard of this. Now, the fact that this carbon footprint idea came from BP, which is British Petroleum, might give you a clue that perhaps this was not the best way to state the problem. And while it's definitely, definitely true that individual action on this issue is essential, that all of us who can must raise our voices in alarm and action. Um, and also we have to acknowledge that there have already been literally hundreds of climate martyrs who have been murdered for their climate actions all around the world. But still, the truth of the matter is, even if we exceeded in, succeeded in <clears throat> shrinking our personal carbon footprint as much as we possibly can, this crisis could not be solved um, by, uh, by simply carbon footprint personal steps. The second layer of our cake in climate change is at its basis a collective problem requiring collective action. Third, um, climate change has also been expressed as a problem of everybody, all people, the idea that we've all caused this by consuming too much. But if you take a closer look, you quickly find that actually climate change is definitely not a problem that has been created equally by every person on the planet. Some have contributed enormously and many, many others have contributed very, very little. And if you look further, you can see that the negative effects that are already taking place of climate change are also not distributed equally. In fact, the impact of climate change is most often greatest on those who have done almost nothing to contribute to it, both in the United States and globally. It is already affecting first and most deeply indigenous people around the world and in general people of color, women and children. So in other words, the third layer of this, what kind of problem is climate change cake, is that at its core, it is a problem of both current and historic injustice and inequity. And thus we have to respond to this crisis in a way that both heals and corrects the systemic injustices of colonialism and racism rather than adding to them. So equity is definitely the key to both our success and to our survival. The fourth layer of this climate change issue uh, concerns basically our whole species essential relationship to our biosphere. Some people have put forward the idea that climate change is, it's just a technical problem, technical solutions. All we need to do is swap out solar and wind for coal and drive EVs instead of gas powered cars and it'll be back to business as usual. But while we definitely, definitely need massive technological innovation on everything from concrete to ocean ships, jet planes and battery storage, this is not really the essence of the problem. In fact, much of Western industrial society has long held that basically the entire living planet exists exclusively for people to conquer to use, to use up, and then to throw away, wherever away is, I don't know. This concept is deeply ingrained in colonial history and frankly, it is still alive and well today. But there is another conception, a conception that as many of you know is long held by many traditional indigenous cultures, which holds that our species is one part of a complex, amazing system of billions of living beings and that we cannot succeed as a species without having a proper relationship to the entire biosphere, the complexity, depth and wonder of which we are just beginning to grasp. Faced with a rate of species extinctions that is hundreds or even thousands of times higher than the natural baseline background rate, we are starting to see movements such as the Green Amendment being debated in the New Mexico legislature right now. Many other rights of nature movements from Lake Erie to Ecuador, all of which recognize that species and ecosystems are not simply resources for humans to use, 
but are living entities with essential value of their own. So the last step on my speed journey, cake layer number five is what I'm calling the experience of climate change. In 1988, when James Hansen first testified, climate change was really almost a vague threat, something to be seen in the future. They all talked about their grandchildren. That was the, that was the catch word, something that our grandchildren are gonna have to worry about. But as everybody here knows, this is definitely no longer true. In the United States alone, for California wildfire victims, for the flooded cities of Houston and New Orleans and New York, and for those experiencing climate injustice from Louisiana to South Carolina to New Mexico, we are actually now experiencing this reality that this world, this planet, this place is no longer the same world that I was born into at least. So for each of us, our personal experience of this change involves not just thoughts, but emotions, psychology, culture, families, faith, communities. We can't deal with the issues of our very survival without being able to express with all forms of artistic expression, our fear, our grief, and our anxiety, as well as our courage and hope. And with so much at stake, we also can't, we can't possibly build a movement for change that doesn't invite us to join together in, in solidarity, to comfort each other as human beings, and to allow time, not just for organizing and fighting, but also for tears, for crying and mourning over what's, what we've been involved in. So this is the layer cake that is behind the creation of the Land Witness Project, which through local storytelling brings together science, collective action, justice, the proper role of our species in the web of life, and our personal and local experiences of climate change. We're aiming to contribute to solving the global problem with local stories from New Mexicans whose lives, livelihoods, and ways of life are already being affected. And in, in addition to the personal, every one of our storytellers is surrounded by a community of people that they influence from downhill skiers to friends of the Bosque de la Pache, from pecan growers to river rafters, cattle ranchers to farmers in the South Valley. And our hope is that these personal stories of leadership and action will move and inspire those uh, people around them and the rest of us to take even greater action. So today's speaker, Biara Tosipena, embodies truly in her experience, in her deep understanding and her leadership, exactly what I've been trying to talk about much better than I can express. So let's hear her story. Thank you, Nancy. I think you, I agree with everything you put forth and um, just wanna thank Land Witness Project and UNM for hosting this and organizing this today. And thank you to everyone who's joined. It's um, good to see all your faces and be in the space together. Um, so Mbiagendi, Sengitiri, with your respect. My name is Biata and um, I'm really honored and humbled to have our, um, our work kind of highlighted in this um, this series, and our story, some of our stories of our northern New Mexico community um, put forth put forth in this way. Um, and I think, yeah, it's you know what brought me to this work is a lot of intersecting issues, a lot of my lived experience. Um, Living adjacent to a nuclear weapons production facility is how I got involved in environmental justice work. And then that's taken me into other areas around oil and gas um, concerns, super fun sites in our community, um, and then threats to our food and seed sovereignty from ge genetic engineering and GMO contamination. So a lot of these issues that we're really concerned about um, as Table Women United, and for myself personally as a Table Woman, um, you know, how do I go about doing this work coming from a place of motherhood 
coming from a place of deep loving care and respect for our water, our land and uh, non-human relatives, our ecologies. And then just from starting to see things from a new perspective, you know, once I started really getting trained from that indigenous sustainable design, um, seeing all around how just our infrastructure is just totally needs redoing from the ground up in ways that are aligned with indigenous ways of knowing. And there's no reason that we can't be integrating these, these things in our society. Um, there's so much out there around modeling our way of life off of natural systems and forest ecologies as a response to climate, climate change and adaptability. Um, so I'll get a little, I'm gonna get into that by sharing a, a response to climate change through the Española Healing Foods Oasis. And, you know, this garden came about as a direct response to climate change adaptability and wanting to conserve water in our community. Um, it's based off of indigenous dryland technologies, which I'll get more into. And it was just in collaboration with so much community members um, and, and NGOs and the local college, um, local farmers, people we've been in networking partnerships for a long time, and just so many volunteers that have come together over the years to help build this um, beautiful space and contribute to it. So um, I wanted to share some pictures of that. Let's see. Having trouble sharing slides. And so, like I said, um, we do live with in proximity to a lot of environmental violence in our state, not just indigenous nations, but all peoples. Um, this is some fracking industry out towards Chaco, one of our ancestral sites. And below that is um, where the hexavalent chromium plume is from legacy waste issues at Los Alamos National Laboratories. And this is already, and that is a site of uh, groundwater contamination in our aquifer. Yeah, we're not, seeing, at least I'm not seeing your screen. I don't know. Oh, really? I mean, I'm seeing your first slide, but I'm not. I'm not seeing the second slide either. Sorry. How about now? Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so this is the second slide. Um, some of, describing some of the environmental violence I was just talking about from oil and gas industry and also from nuclear weapons production. This is um, area G. It's the nuclear waste dump that was built directly on top of one of our Tewa ancestral cultural sites. Um, some of our oldest places of prayer were on this mesa and they're now filled with nuclear waste above and below ground in unlined dirt pits or in those kind of white tents that you see there. Um, and as a result of diverting wildfires due from climate change um, away from this site, we lost over 80% of our forested lands in Santa Clara Pueblo. Um, that we had to give up as for to save this nuclear waste dump from catching on fire. So at Table Women United, we really believe in centering um, indigenous pregnant families, indigenous women, um, and our way of life as Central, central to environmental protections, regulations, policies. And we believe that if, if these pregnant families are protected, everyone is protected. And so we put forth the model of Navatoi Jia, which translates in Tewa to land worker mother. And if she's protected, everybody's protected. Um, and this really builds off of Mohawk midwife Gudji Cook's model of woman as the first environment. And we've expanded that to be, um, you know, we come from, we all come from water as our first environment to be more inclusive of all types of families. And knowing that 
one generation or three generations are impacted by whatever that pregnant parent is exposed to during the course of that pregnancy. So any environmental or toxic exposures um, right off the bat impact three generations. Um, and so this is really calling attention to the reproductive justice impacts of living next to these kind of industries. And we could, that's a whole other presentation we could go into. And so knowing that we center indigenous pregnant families in our work um, in Navat Oijia, it's really, that's where all of this stems from. And then being in that connection to place as indigenous and land-based communities, um, it's really easy to see how to put forth and give attention to our community and uh, things we can start to look at, you know, around how we care for our water, how we come together in these communal spaces for all of these resources that we share and that contribute to our freedom, health, wealth, and wellness as a community. Um, all of these things, yes, are part of that interconnected web. So the first part of the garden, you know, it was um, planning and design. We had a really amazing team of um, mostly volunteers, including Christy Green of um, Anchor Engineering uh, and Aiden Anchor Engineering and Radical. Um, we did need that official landscape architect to give that official stamp to designs. And that's when we started getting a lot of attention. Um, and then really being able to dream big about this space and then scale it down as we needed to. And this slope, you know, it was, I grew up in this park, going to this park and um, I, it was at one time it was all sod and green grass. And then for the, for about 20 years, 25 years, it was just a bare eroded slope and a hot spot in the community. Um, and coming to this place with my reclaimed vision of, you know, um, indigenous design, it was a really optimal site for rainwater harvesting and dry land farming. So um, this is kind of an above shot. You can see Valdez Park in Española, which is the kind of green area. And then the slope, which is the Española Healing Foods Oasis, um, directly beneath the parking lot behind City Hall. And so the parking lot, um, I don't know if you can see my little arrow. This is actually what we would call an urban watershed. Um, so all of the rainwater runoff comes onto this slope and that's the rainwater that we're harvesting. And that is what is based on indigenous technology and science. Because if you go to any of the mountaintops and ancient gardens in our community, in our, um, our mesas, our mountains, you'll find these ancient gardens where this kind of techniques are still working to this day, thousands of years later, hundreds of years later, some of them but um, still working. Um, we did break it up into four phases um, to make it more manageable. The, we partnered with the city of Española um, and so they were able to lend us use of their machinery for doing the contour and terracing work on the slope. Um, and so this project was really an answer to solving their erosion problems, um, which was a big issue with the site because every year um, there was so much ruts being formed from the monsoon seasons that they would have to come in with heavy machinery, scrape off all of the vegetation to fill in the ruts, but then the vegetation wasn't able to establish and do the work of stopping the erosion control. So it was just this kind of never ending cycle of this poor slope constantly getting scraped of all vegetation year after year. Um, so they really liked the idea of it solving their erosion problems on this slope and um, it becoming an outdoor community educational space in addition to that. So here's more of planning out the grading. And for those of you that don't know about um, contour farming, it's, it's making swales and berms where the land is level coming off of a slope. So anywhere, any site that has a slope, you can do this kind of rainwater harvesting um, and dry land techniques. And so you can use just the simple A-frame, which is just the, some wood like this. And you can Google up A-frames and how to measure contour on a piece of land 
or a laser level um, if you want to get fancy. So this is uh, after a rainfall event at the garden. Um, you could see how much water just got caught right off the bat with some baby amaranth and having that slow percolation. Um, and that's kind of the same energy putting into the project. You know, it's, it's, it's different when you have a multi-year project that really engages community versus this kind of um, lands, like fast paced contracted out landscaping that doesn't have the time to take all a lot of these things into consideration. Um, the next phase was being really intentional around our plantings and what plant relatives we wanted to honor and put into this space. Um, and it, so the garden contains hundreds, over 200 varieties of plants and bushes and grasses, fruit trees, native trees. Um, a lot of the plants that we chose were in collaboration with birth workers in the community, doulas, um, farmers, herbalists, healers, um, when asked what plants they would want to see there that they could go and harvest. So that was that was a really favorite process of mine with this project. Um, I think so much we have so much to learn from our plant elders. They here were here before humans in the right order of the universe. Um, humans are very recent in that order. And so we need to really humble ourselves to these teachers and what we have to learn and model our, um, our place after and the way we coexist with each other. So then um, that was the fun part when the community could really come in. They seem to enjoy the planting days a lot. We'd get good turnouts for all the community planting days. And so in exchange for learning some of these techniques on dry land farming and, and traditional agriculture, um, they were very happy to lend their hands and labor to building this. So we had some really beautiful workshops over the years um, and people come in together to make this a reality. There's some more of the kids. So once the plantings are done, you could see this as a couple of years in, um, we also built some hardscape on the site and um, kept adding more swales and just plantings over the years. And heavy mulching is also a technique. So we're constantly having to remulch. A lot of companion planting, um, fruit tree guilds, which is just another form of a milpa except with fruit trees. So all of um, another lesson that plants have to teach us, you know, of being in community and we're not meant to go through life alone, but um, you never see a plant growing by itself. It's always in it's always in relation with other organisms or plants all around them. Um, so we really like to point that out. There's also we had to have addition of a lot of stonework into the garden to help with erosion. Um, stones to me are alive, are also living beings. I, I kind of dispute that with my kids' science classes every year that um, rocks aren't living things because they do store great energy, um, heat, sun. They also harvest water from the air around them. So they're very useful when it comes to dry land farming. Um, and we actually put all, all of this stone was with human hands passed up the slope one by one, you know, in like straight lines of like 30 to 80 people some days. Um, which is probably how our ancestors did it as well on some of these ancient sites. And um, they're in the shape of Aravanyu, which is the representation of our rivers. And there's two of them, one coming from the north, one coming from the south. The one from the south is more a feathered serpent. And that, you know, is part of um, honoring the rights of indigenous peoples to continue to come together from the north and south to share food and medicine and seeds with each other since we have, um, since time immemorial. That's also part of our food and seed sovereignty. So it's really concerning to see the government's response to climate change, which is the militarization of our borders and, um, you know, creating more and more detention facilities as a for-profit industry, you know, and, and how that's being responded when 
we've been working with farmers from Guatemala for over 11 years now to rematriate some seeds and through our amaranth workshops and um, other cooking. And it's really beautiful to, to honor those ancient roadways of connection with them year after year. And um, those relations are part of our inherent rights as indigenous people to continue unhindered. Um, this is a little bit into the nitty gritty of the project, but just, yeah, we've clocked over 6,000 volunteer hours at this garden. And when you translate that into contributions, that's over $60,000, you know? So learning how to re leverage resources from um, where we've been blessed with grants year after year to keep the project going. Um, and so there's a lot of ways to, to get into that. I'm happy to talk to folks more one-on-one -on, -one on the kind of project management piece. Um, lots of sponsors and donors um, over the years. And um, we're really grateful for all of those folks. This is what it looked like um, maybe six years, six, seven years ago. This is it today. Um, so just in five years, giving that little bit of love and care into a site um, with that community collaboration being central to it. Also centering indigenous ancestral life ways, you know, can really um, just have so many benefits and positive outcomes with the people who are involved. And um, so we're in our fifth year of this project. We also have added on um, a seed library next door at the public library where people can get seeds from all the plants in this garden. And um, we were able to mentor a lot of youth to be seed keepers. That kind of got put on hold with the COVID situation. We had a lot of workshops planned around seeds, but hopefully we can pick that up um, again soon. But this, you know, anyway, so the, if you're interested, this site is in Valdez Park in Española. It's open to everybody, accessible to everybody, um, where you can go and see some of these, these methods firsthand. And this is just more on kind of project details. You know, I won't get too much into, but um, just to say that There are so many directions that um, we can go in when you know when looking at centering indigenous communities and making sure that they're strengthened from within. You know that um, so much of the legacy of colonialism has been that extraction and that taking of our communities and these our food resources and our food systems. Um, to where we weren't even allowed to call that our wealth as a community. You know, the, that was how we were rich. That was how we were wealthy. We still have these things, you know, the traditional agriculture in the community has never gone away. It's always been there. It's, it continues to be there. Um, I have a lot of faith and hope in our, our communities as land-based peoples who share Asequia systems, who share seeds, who share food with each other, medicine, who are working to strengthen birth as ceremony, who um, love and care deeply for family and restoring um, and resisting through returning to these methods of, of uh, survival and sovereignty. And um, there's just so much that can be accomplished. You know, I think even looking at some of the environmental violence issues at this garden, we've done a handful of workshops on micro and bioremediation, which is a method of cleaning up contamination from soil. You know, so we're, well, this, so on one hand, while we're talking to community about the issues and threats we're facing to our environment and health, um, we're also giving them solutions that they can do in their backyards if they're worried about it. You know, so like, oh, plant these, plant these sunflowers and amaranth, they're going to help to pull heavy metals from the soil. Do this, inoculate your soil with uh, oyster mushrooms. They help to clean out oil and gas. Um, and there's so much, and again, like there's so much out there that can clean up some of these contaminated sites that we're also very concerned about that are not 
given that loving care um, like this site was, but that are maybe behind armed guards and razor wire that we have to pray to the spirits of that place from the roadside. Um, so not having access to our ancestral sites and places that are now under military occupation, you know, and um, those sites are cleaned up to state standards of cleanup, not necessarily to what is protective of indigenous pregnant families, like I mentioned. You know, a lot of those cleanup standards um, are based in, in environmental and scientific racism where adult white males are the center and standard for protection. You know, and that crosses a lot into medical and, and scientific institutions. Um, and so we really want Navatoya Gia to be the center of environmental protections and cleanup standards to be protective of that um, demographic. So healing, restorative work, regenerative work, um, that's calling all of us into action these days. Uh, I would love to just be a gardener and seed keeper, um, aspiring herbalist and doula, <laughs> you know, all of these things. But um, the reality is I have to be an environmental advocate and be constantly resisting that because of what we live in and because of the industries taking place in our homelands. Um, and we really need everybody um, in line with that, that we can shift our economies to one of um, restorative, regenerative, collaborative systems and away from a military and war-based economy that we're basically stuck in economic slavery to, in my opinion. So um, yeah, there's a lot more I could go into, but maybe I'll just wait for, for questions or, or anything from people where to go from here. Thank you very much. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Yeah, so I had a few questions prepared and then if anyone else wants to like, just put them in the chat, um, we can ask those too. Um, so the first question I have is how can projects or initiatives like the Land Witness Project help environmental justice organizers? And I don't know if, if that's for me or for Nancy. For either of you guys. Okay. Do you want to go first, Nancy? Nancy, you're muted. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So I confess that I was reading the other questions in the chat and wasn't paying attention. So do you want to ask me again, Sophia? I'm sorry. <laughs> Cool. Okay. Uh, how can projects or initiatives like the Land Witness Project help environmental justice organizers? Mm, well, uh, I know one of our uh, conceptions that we um, we had that has sort of been interrupted by you know what is that after we launched each we we did the interviews with certain organizers from all different walks of life from around the state and uh, then we would have a sort of a literally an opening where we would invite people from the community to come and uh, we would show the video and tell the story and just talk to people about, well, you know, this person's doing this, what else could be done, you know, enlist support and actually use it as an organizing tool. Uh, we haven't really done that yet um, because of the logistics of the pandemic and the slowness of which we've uh, been able to produce the videos, but, that's what we're hoping still to do is this is not just uh, a pretty videos. We're actually want to use this for organizing um, and in the different sectors. So we did an interview, for example, with um, someone from, who is a white water rafter operator who's lived in the Taos region in the Northern part of the, the Rio Grande they, that um, has talked about the changes. And so, so people who are concerned about water and uh, you know outdoor things, what can they do to make an impact on the climate? What can they do to uh, work around those issues? So that's what we were hoping to do. Hasn't happened yet, but we're not giving up. And I would just add that storytelling is really important um, when it's, you know, 
done in a meaningful way that's building long long term relations that's lifting up the work already being done in impacted communities. Um, I think that with that foundational work of anti colonial and anti racism focus that Nancy spoke at the beginning is really key. Um, to looking at the big picture of what environmental justice frontline communities are having to face. Um, and people that are knowledgeable of with it, like that have it in with within these systems, you know, like can really be influential um, in how they utilize that power and privilege. Mm. Um, and yeah, there's just there's just so much. I mean, just like pick an issue and pick a community and like in your probably in your backyard, there's things going on and people doing some really great work. Um, but I think like, again, like asking, being just being cautious of asking indigenous communities to share their knowledge and ways of knowing um, when their communities have yet to be restored to their original pristine state, to what is going on around them. Um, Dr. Greg Cajete from Santa Clara Pueblo talks about indigenous communities as an indicator species for their environment. And so looking at these communities and the health within those communities can usually tell you the health of the surrounding environment um, because we are actively daily um, live with that thread of disconnection from our land or that attempted disconnection from a culture of violence. And we're up against those systems every day and those systems look like the Bureau of Land Management. They look like um, Department of Energy. They look like the prison industrial complex, you know, the, the military complex. Um, those are all the forest service, you know, things that like, we no longer have the ability to give care and love to these places like we did in the past. And it's, and we're all feeling those impacts today. You know, another thing, I don't know if it I'm just, so topical, if you've heard, now that you've heard Beata speak, there was an article in the um, Albuquerque paper today that was reporting on a report that uh, Los Alamos National Labs were not serious about uh, the firefighting. They didn't, they haven't submitted after these disastrous fires that you talked about and all the things that you know, impacted your community as a result, that still you read an article in the paper and you go, this is what she was talking about. And they're still not taking actions around this. And that is, I mean, there you go, R write them a letter, you know, who's in charge of this, you know, there's a grounds for action right now. Once you've heard that story, you realize that this isn't just some bureaucratic issue. The, the labs have not carried out a firefighting plan and a fire protection plan that would keep from happening what happened 20 years ago. So it's, it's, it's literally every day you're living these things and all of these things matter. So that's another connection. And just one other thing is Steffi put in the chat that there's also on each of the stories that we write, we, we ask each of the presenters to the storytellers to tell what's important to them and ask if you can join or help in any way or you know whatever kind of community support. So we've also listed that. Thanks, Steffi. And there's a, there's a question in the chat. I don't know if you guys saw that from Victoria um, for Bieta. Um, how could those who want to advocate for environmental justice best serve the cause? Also, how can people who conduct research on environmental issues contribute to better, under, uh, better understanding of environmental injustices? Mm -hmm. Um, I think environmental justice is very difficult um, for myself and my lived experience. Justice is not served historically for indigenous and um, people of color impacted communities, oppressed peoples. So I've found, I find the justice piece to be actually really disempowering a lot of times. Um, you're, you go into spaces that are not meant for you. Um, your way of knowing, like for myself, my indigenous way of knowing is not held in equity with um, white supremacy. 
And because a lot of our community experts who maybe have a PhD in working the land, but not a PhD from an institution, they're not given equal validity when it comes to having a voice or a place, you know, um, to weigh in and with, with meaningful community engagement before decisions are made. And so oftentimes we're coming in after the harm has already been enacted, um, trying to do harm reduction and it's, it's not working. Um, and what, so like looking at this project, I think it's, it's more meaningful to put energy into that, those ancestral ways of knowing of the place you are a guest on or a part of. Um, that energy is a lot older than the history of colonial violence that has happened on these, on these places. So what were the values and ways of being and living with where you are? Um, living in alignment with those things. You know, I could be up at the labs every day protesting, but that's still giving it my energy, that's still feeding it. And so there is times where I'm going to step in and do that, but for the most part, I want to be putting my energy and focus into things that are um, restorative or regenerative or um, helping in an active way to keep these things alive that despite centuries of colonial violence, my ancestors made sure to pass on to me, things like our heirloom seeds, like having daily interactions with our waterways and our watersheds, with our plant relatives, um, with, our, my, with my children, you know, having time to play on a daily basis and have space for that joy. And those are all ways of um, really feeding the true energy of place and tapping into those things. Going beyond land acknowledgements, you know, like it's, I think that's it's great that people are doing that, but really look seriously at land back movements, you know, and all the um, all the ways of reclamation that are happening and and really honoring place because ultimately, when you talk about decolonization or environmental justice, um, that can never be achieved unless you know the capital capitalism is abolished unless white supremacy and racism is abolished unless militarism is abolished, all of these things, you know, it's, it's like the, we'll just keep constantly spinning our wheels trying to attain it. Um, so it has to be with the community, with the impacted communities, and it has to be from the ground up. It has to be working on meaningful community engagement that's long lasting, and it has to be building living relations with indigenous nations, um, not just government to government, but community to community. Um, you know, these are all ways to lend support to environmental justice. But I know, um, yeah, there is some great organizations that have the resources to like have lawyers on staff and really get into that justice system. Um, but for us, where I live, we don't really have that, you know? So it's like, we have to really weigh where we want to put um, our resources and energy to. I don't know if that answered the second question. Let me see. Yeah, there was another question in the chat from Adriana. That's actually my mom, so hi mom. Um, she was wondering if you could talk about how to center indigenous ways of knowing and broad environmental justice organizing and strategy. And how can this take place, especially given what you said about being mindful of protecting indigenous practices and knowledge? Well, are there um, the policymakers? Are any of them indigenous? The you know, looking at where are the indigenous people at the table, um, at the banquet, at the room, at, you know, whatever. You whatever analogy you want to use. Um, where is the community education and input and dialogue around what, are, what is being proposed for our communities? Um, and not just in, you know, not, not just indigenous, any impacted communities. Um, what is the historical and generational story of place and the land that's being impacted. 
And can that be remedied? Can that be reclaimed? Can it be restored to the first peoples in some in an active way? Who is at the center of environmental regulations and protections? Right now, everything is so siloed when it comes to the environment. Um, I can't even go to a public hearing and talk about what, how what they're releasing into the air is affecting our groundwater because I'm then told it's outside the scope of a meeting. Um, that our groundwater is separate from our surface water, is separate from our storm water, is separate from snowfall and rainfall when we know in our indigenous way of knowing the water cycle is a complete whole, that there's no separating those things. But yet that indigenous way of knowing is not centered in environmental policy in our state. So that's just like one example of that disconnect of the systemic racism that's inherent um, when it comes to the environment. And there's so many examples like that. Um, it could come with radiation exposure when I mentioned how they center adult white males instead of Navatoigia. The current radiation exposure regulations are based on an adult white male. And that's how they determine what workers get exposed to, what gets released into the environment, what cleanup standards are. It's not based on an indigenous pregnant woman or pregnant person. So um, until those things are like put in place, then that's, that's where I talk about the kind of disempowering situations of working, trying to get justice when these things have not been um, addressed. And it would mean the shutting down of a lot of facilities. It would be having to transition out of these things into something different, into these natural systems of where nothing is wasted, where um, everything is like recycled and has a purpose, you know, like it would be a lot of intentional radical work. Um, even when I talk about birthing as being an intersection of environmental justice, you know, and how our children come into this world, is it in, into a culture of peace or is it into a culture of violence? You know, and just that very foundation of our experience coming into being in this place um, sets so much for the tone of how we go about our lives, of how, of what we expect, of what we um, feel comfortable in demanding for ourselves when it comes to our human rights and civil rights, you know? So it's, it's just this, how families are cared for is environmental justice, you know, how we are given access to healing is environmental justice when we can't heal if we don't have clean water, air, or land, where we don't have our traditional foods unless you can pay $15 a pound for buffalo. You know, it's like um, even that, you know, like we advocate, like we know that we need our traditional foods to have healthy bodies so that we can resist not getting sick from environmental pollution. But um, how is that accessible? And how is that centering indigenous life ways and knowing when um, the original relational relations of those food systems can't even access those food systems, you know? So there's no reason that we need to have, and yeah, I could talk about big ag and monoculture and the food and seed sovereignty for a long time, um, but that's another example, you know, of, of how do we, and like, just start to think about, like think of any situation and how do you center indigenous pregnant families in this situation, you know, and that's a good place to start. Nina, do you want to ask your question? I saw you had your hand raised. Hi, Megan, thank you. Um, I'm a Black Street Wood Forest person from the, uh, the Navajo Nation. That's my mom's clan. And uh, in that way, I'm a Navajo woman is what I, I said to you. And I wanted to acknowledge uh, you and our language. And also, um, I was curious as to what 
work Tewa Women United has done, um, if any, in regard to uranium. Um, I know citizens of New Mexico are largely concerned it's a hot issue. Uh, I grew up in Lupton, Arizona, which was about 24 miles uh, downstream from the Church Rock spill that occurred in 1979. Um, and I'm currently uh, a student at UNM Law, I'm a 1L. And so um, I've been confronting a lot of issues, the same issues that you're talking about and the same frustrations and um, just fighting as it were with the concepts that the law introduces to us as indigenous people, how hypocritical it is and how, um, how it only serves, you know, four people and they're all white males. It only serves a merchant, it serves a property owner, it serves, um, let's see, a banker and an insurance rep. And these are the four individuals that the law seeks to find you know, remedies for, and we are not any of those people, women or indigenous people. So I, I think just from my perspective that this, oh, you got a lot of questions regarding um, interest in forming a collective and how do you go about, you know, affecting change. And I think that you're doing that here. You said community is where it starts and just having these conversations being aware. Um, so sorry, I'm a bit long winded and I'm excited about this. So I'm talking a lot about it. Um, but I'm in confronting my frustrations with the law itself, being an indigenous person, having to be told that these laws protect these white men, these, these property owners, you know, as indigenous people, we, we are uh, inhabitants of trust land. We don't, we don't own title to land. And that is a huge issue. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I say all that to say that um, I had to speak with one of the academic um, aides today, and she basically let me know that uh, community is important. It's an important piece to the puzzle. There are routes that you can take within the law, and often. The, if you travel within the law, you will get stopped. But that's when you pick up the community piece of it. And that's when your community activists go forward. And if you get enough of a community going where you actually have a voice and it affects the businesses in a negative way, like we saw with the Dakota Access Pipeline, those two pieces work together in addition to the legislature. And we have Deb Holland in there. How, what could we do? So I think um, I, the pendulum swings, you know, and sometimes we get, we get really angry. And then sometimes we say, oh, well, wait, this is a different generation. These people aren't responsible for where we are today. And we, you know, really sympathize with people and we kind of lay down a little bit. And then we come to the middle where we say, I don't want to, you know, I'm, I'm okay where I'm at right now. And then we go back to anger and it just keeps going back and forth. So in that, in the way that we have uh, emotional, we have an emotional pendulum. We also have a political one that swings and the political one will go democratic and it will go Republican. It will go conservative and it will go liberal. And so at times when it hits a liberal area, I think that's when we have to be ready to strike. And I could be, um, I could be going about this all wrong, but those are just my thoughts. And I thank you for your time and your presence. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing some of your experience and your thoughts on that. We have been networking for many years with uranium mining communities. Um, I've thought about those places I've, I've been to out in Nagizi and, you know, seen cornfields in between fracking pads. And um, this is where I think about the restorative work of like, how can we 
give the same love and care to these kind of places um, that we would to a garden, you know, to this garden that I thought like they, they're just as deserving. Um, I always use the metaphor that we wouldn't leave our sick grandmother alone in the hospital, you know, um, we would go and visit and try and take care of them. Um, and that's the same with some of these places that have been so severely abused. And the systemic issues are super frustrating. You know, there is a revolutionary movement that's needed on a lot of levels. Um, I really struggle with the limitations of working within the system. Um, when I know it's, its foundation is just um, sometimes feels irreparable. And I just also, but then I also see like how my role as a doula and birth worker is really uh, minimizing the harm of these very necessary transitions into something new, you know? And so if this is, if we're in this place of transformation of, um, revolutionary radical change, how can we all work together to ease that, um, you know, that birthing into something, something new and different that centers these things we're talking about instead of this culture of allowable harm to our environment to where then the burden is placed on our communities, like you say, of having to mobilize and build a base and then hopefully maybe get some change if we do that good, if we do a good job. You know, and that's um, that's not right and just, in my view. The burden shouldn't be placed on impacted communities to try and reverse harm that's already been allowed to happen. You know, and so what is it about our society that, and, and, if, and you hear it talked about as a precautionary principle. You know, there's some people that have done really um, good analysis on that. So or why, why, why can't corporations and industry prove they're going to do no harm before they're even allowed to open their doors? You know, instead, it's um, total opposite of that, where our environmental protection agencies, our New Mexico Environment Department, they're permitting agencies. They permit that harm to happen on some level on a daily basis, and that's how they regulate it. You know, they're not about the clean environment or they're, they're just players in that game that you're seeing, you know, another person at the table. Um, and so, yeah, we keep, we keep feeding into that same system and not, not getting very, the results that we need. And we can do that work, that hard work of transformational change or nature's gonna push the issue. And it's, it's going to be more drastic and um, uh, dramatic that we'll have to respond. Or we can start to do that work of transforming since now. And we, sh and it's, we should have been since hundreds of years ago. You know, um, people have, I have so many indigenous elders who have been saying these same things before I ever said them for a long time. And who is listening to them? You know, so... Um, I'm not saying anything new that everything I've, I know was taught to me by my elders. So um, yeah, thank you for saying what you did. I, I see another question in the chat uh, from Megan. Maybe we should keep this um, as our last question, if that's okay. Um, if there are any other pressing questions, put them in the chat and we'll try to get to them. But um, uh, Megan says, how do you envision the continued involvement and empowerment um, of Española youth and families in the Land Witness Project and Tewa Women's United? This is for both of you. Um, gosh, that's so much I want to do. <laughs> so much that we can do. I've, I've seen a resurgence in gardens and interests in, first in seeds, acquiring heirloom seeds. Um, I want to see everyone have a backyard garden where they're growing out their own seeds for their own little personal seed house. We need to enact GE free zones in our communities to protect these seeds. A um, lot of really great legislation, again, talking about working within the system, but there is some things like the Green Amendment and um, others that can really, really change how accountability I think is is being looked at these days. 
Um, Espanola is a border town that needs a lot of um, on a lot of le on a lot of levels, and I claim it as my own. Um, I see the connections between the economic dependency that we have on the labs um, for our community and know that that's not sustainable. Um, I have a lot of hopes in alternative economies locally and how what that could look like for our young people to have jobs to come home to, to be able to make a living off of their family land um, so that it's viable you know, and not just growing alfalfa, but really like, how do you make a living as a small farmer if you have, you know, have land to come back to um, where right now you can't really, you know, so how do we shift that? Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of resources that were um, need to be put back that we've sacrificed over the years to a military economy, to oil and gas, to um, a lot of these US colonial systems that have divided and conquered Asequia and indigenous communities um, to have these kind of constant tensions going on that we have to navigate. Um, but yeah, I think the educational system too, that's another example where all of these things we can put, you know, to education of our young people and are they being taught these things? Are they being taught, what are they being taught that is going to really serve their survival and sustainability into the future? Um, or is it still centering Western European dominance and curriculum? You know, it's, it's, it's not centering indigenous families. <laughs> Um, so yeah, there's just a lot we could talk about as far as what we could do in Espanola and um, a lot of people are doing it. There's some, I could name a bunch of, like look at Barrios Unidos, look at the work going on to help address unsheltered um, families and people in the community, um, restoring food systems, you know, protecting our seeds, all of those things. There's some really great work that folks could use support. Thank you so very much to our speakers. Thank you to such a wonderful um, engaged audience for asking great questions. Um, thank you very much. There's a lot of, I'm just looking at the chat now. There's a lot of questions. If um, I'm happy to respond to them via email, um, if you want to reach out to me, if I didn't get to answer it today. Thank you so much. That's so kind of you. Do you, do you mind putting your email in the chat? Would that be okay? Yes. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, it's just Beata at tablewomenunited.org. Thank you, Beata. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Sophia. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you, everybody.